Good evening, everybody. My name is, is Nick Evans. I'm the director of CODAL, the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. And I welcome you all to this annual lecture, which is uh, special this year. CODAL holds a, a le public lecture every year. Uh, this year is the International Year of Indigenous Languages, so it's a very special pleasure to hold it on the topic uh, that you see before you tonight. Before our welcome to country, I'd also like to welcome some special guests. So firstly, uh, to uh, Uncle Greg Sims, who is an Aboriginal elder on campus at Western Sydney University and on the advisory committee there uh, as a community elder and more importantly than that, a Bidjigal elder. Uncle Greg is well known as an activist for reconciliation, a traditional woodcarver, a storyteller, and an educator of Aboriginal culture. His ties to the Aboriginal community of Greater Western Sydney are through his ancestral links to the Gunungurra water dragon lizard people of the Blue Mountains and the Gadigal whale people. Uncle Greg grew up in La Perouse and is now a resident of Greater Western Sydney. I'd also like to welcome uh, two more female Bidjigal elders who are members of Uncle Greg's family, Auntie Marge Dixon and Auntie Barb Keeley. Welcome tonight. And further, I'd like to welcome five other invited guests, Professor Barney Glover, Vice-Chancellor and President of Western Sydney University, Maxine Ryan of Trapeze, Aboriginal health worker, Reuben Bolt, Director of Nurragilly at University of New South Wales, Professor Kate Stevens, the Director of the Marx Institute at WSU, and Dawn Gordon, Aboriginal health worker in the Integrated Team Care of Sydney Children's Hospital. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Rebecca and later Nicole, who will be doing the sign interpreting tonight. So at this point, I would now like to call upon and uh, invite Uncle Greg to carry out the welcome to country. Thank you, Uncle Greg. Uh, firstly, I would like to say good evening to all. Good evening. <laughs> what a me, Mitigate God and Butter. Hello, friends. It's good to see you. My name's Greg Sims. Everyone knows me as Uncle Greg. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge we are on Dudduck land. I would like to acknowledge the elders past and present. We don't own the land. The land owns us. We come from Mother Earth. We are the land. And the land we're upon today belongs part of the Gadigal tribe of the Dudduk Nation, the whale people of Sydney. We are the saltwater Dudduk people here, where I'm residing now in the western Sydney, in the Mount Druid area, which is the Wiana Mudigal tribal area of the Dudduk Nation. I am one of the Aboriginal elders of western Sydney, and to become an elder, you have to do lots and lots of work in your community before you get respect in return. And we as elders, we go out and teach how to break down barriers and build bridges. We're out in the community trying to turn people's lives around. I'd just like to say that I'm also one of the Aboriginal elders on the advisory committee at Western Sydney University. I belong to the Gundan Gutter Nation in the Blue Mountains, where I belong to the Water Dragon Lizard people. On the south coast, I belong to the Butterwang people around Batemans Bay, Aladala, the Beach Plover, and further down, with the Yuan Nation, which is the Butterwang, is a tribe of the Yuan, where I belong to the Black Duck people. 
I'd just like to say that uh, when a lot of people come to this sacred country, they forget that our people are the First Nation people of this sacred land. And they think all Aboriginal people throughout the country speak the same language. You know, we have well over 500 dialects. In New South Wales, we have well over 136. So this must be a multicultural country before settlers came in 1788 and the ones that followed. <laughs> By saying this, we are all Australians. And we as Aboriginal elders, we don't exclude people from the circle. We allow people to come to circle, into the circle, share their values and stories. We will never have knowledge if we don't do this. And once we start learning from each other, then we're heading in the right direction towards reconciliation. I remember my auntie Susie when she was alive. She used to use these beautiful words such as, the music will always sound better if we use both the black and white keys. <laughs> and I think it's a beautiful saying. It wouldn't hurt you to um, use those words. And where we live today is one community, many cultures. And I must say, being an Aboriginal elder of Western Sydney, I support Muslim communities within the Sydney-based area. And it's, it's honour to be an elder because it's taken me over 60 years to get to this level. Growing up in the eastern shores of Botany Bay, a place called La Perouse, which I classify as my university campus and my playpen, where my elders taught me and taught me well. They taught me always show respect, acknowledge, never be greedy and always share. Today, I live that life. And old people said to me, take these values and stories into the next generation and share. So when I made my trek out into Western Sydney back in 1995, where I promised a woman I would marry her the following year, which I did. I got married out in Western Sydney. And I must say that um, living in the Western Sydney all those years, living with a diverse of Aboriginal people, living between Blacktown and Penrith, where we have well over 95 different dialects of Aboriginal people. And here I am sharing my saltwater culture with the running water people and the muddy water people. How many Aboriginal people we have in the room here? Up the back there and over here, any more here? We do have a lot of Aboriginal people, but they don't know if they're Aboriginal or not. Beg your pardon? We're, we're the saltwater people from La Perouse, from the Bidjigal country, where um, Pemaway used to spend a lot of his time. And my Auntie Barb up there, she comes from the Pemaway bloodline. So we have a lot of history in La Perouse, who we are and who have connections. But I must say that um, if you don't know for sure if you've got Aboriginal blood in you or not, the best way to find out is that when you leave here to go home, you go back to your family tree and you grab that family tree with both hands and you shake the life out of it. <laughs> and don't be surprised if an Aboriginal person drops out. <laughs> because a lot of the uh, Anglo-Saxons, so-called Anglo-Saxons that live in Sydney and Western Sydney, a lot of them got Aboriginal blood in them from the early settlers' times when they came in 1788. They married into Aboriginal women. So we, but in, 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 out in the west where I live, where I've been residing, 85% 80, of the Dunnett people has got Irish blood. 85%. Isn't that wonderful? And I, myself, I've got Scottish. I've got a lot of Scottish in me. Being a Sims, we do have a coat of arms in Scotland, like other uh, surnames. So uh, thank you for having me here this, uh, this evening. And I remember coming through here many, many years ago in the old trams, when the trams used to run. And the university, the way it is today, it was never that big. It was never that big. We just come through in the trams and go into the city to do our shopping and spend time in, in the city. 
because we used to love coming into this, going into the city and spending a bit of time. But anyway, so before I get the welcome, I'd just like to acknowledge the organisers that put all this together. I'd like to acknowledge um, Professor Barney Glover, Vice-Chancellor of Western Sydney University, and other distinguished guests we have here. I'm Uncle Greg, I'm here to conduct the work on the country. But just before I do, I would like to, I'd just like to say this. Our family marched across the Sydney Harbour Bridge back in 1932, 86 years ago when they opened the bridge, the whale people of Sydney. They marched across the bridge with the whale bone designs on their, on their body. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of who I am. And I just love going out, meeting people and sharing stories. So I'm Uncle Greg, I'm the conductor, welcome to the country. I'm not gonna leave this poster too long. So before I do, I'd just like to say, when we take our next step, just remember the ones that walked this sacred land before. Chari Mara, Daraka Pemel, Kawi Maria Pemel, Gararinki Babana, by name of the Nai Nai Dizzy Guy, Dahana Gavani the other one, the Gararinki Tiari, the Gararinki, the Gami Guy, Gulia William Gunagal, Dagunagal, Dala Lawi Mukakat Bala Nagami, this is a Lawi in his dream of Gunagal, Jamia Tiari, the Gararinki Yoda Yomana, Miriya Garang Barak, and Daraka Pemel, did we go? Did you get all that? This is Darak lands, the land of ancestors. There are spirits to walk among us. Spirits that have been here since the dream time. Our language and our culture have been passed down from generation to generation to continue an unbroken culture that has extended for thousands of years. In the language of our people, we welcome you to Darak lands. Thank you and have a lovely evening. So uh, thank you so much, um, Uncle Greg, for making us feel so welcome here, uh, for your wisdom and for the, your generosity of spirit. And uh, that's something which I hope will guide us uh, through the night and through uh, the years uh, and millennia to come. So I'd now like to introduce our speaker for the night, uh, Rachel Nordlinger. I've known Rachel since my first year teaching at Melbourne University in 1988. I've got to explain what known means because uh, her name was on the student roll uh, and she was one of those mysterious names on student rolls who we didn't know who the face belonged to. Until the examiner's meeting, there was someone up there with a top grade and we still didn't know and we were wondering, but somehow Rachel had managed to get through the year without coming to many lectures at all, uh, <laughs> and still ace it. So I probably shouldn't be telling that story in a room full of students uh, to give bad examples, but it's, it, maybe you can make a comeback like Rachel did. Um, Rachel did her honours year at, up at Pigeonhole on Bilinara. Uh, then she went on to do her master's degree at University of Melbourne on Wambaya, another language, then went off to uh, the US at Stanford to do a PhD. Uh, later on, she returned to the University of Melbourne, where she is now Professor of Linguistics, Director of the Research Unit for Indigenous Languages, and a Chief Investigator in our Centre of Excellence. And Rachel leads the so-called SHAPE program, which is concerned with documenting the languages of our region. Her research centres around the description and documentation of Australia's indigenous languages. She's worked with Bilinara, Wombaya, Gudanji, Murinpata and Maringar to record and preserve their traditional languages. And she's also worked with the Teitundili language of Timor-Leste. She's written a grammar of Wombaya 
and with another codal chief investigator, Felicity Meekins, a second grammar of Bilinata. And she's the co-editor with Harold Koch of the most up-to-date and comprehensive book on Australian languages, the Languages and Linguistics of Australia. It's probably not that widely known how much work goes into writing a grammar. It's really the work of many, many years. You've got to sit and yarn with people. You've got to learn to pronounce things a new way, hear the stories, try to work out all the jigsaw puzzles that the language gives you. You'll probably hear about some of those tonight. And then write it all in a way that captures in a few hundred pages all of the complexities of language. Just think of everything you're going to say in English or your mother tongue over your lifetime, a grammar aims to distill all of that. Um, so Rachel has gone down that difficult road for two languages and in, that, in doing that she's preserved them for uh, future generations. Um, but unfortunately both those languages haven't been transmitted, uh, at least not directly, to younger generations. There's another language we will hear a lot about tonight, Murungpatha, which is alive and well. And Rachel's work on that has led off down a whole lot of new directions that you can only begin to follow when you've got young, fluent speakers to work with. Uh, she's also published on syntactic and morphological theory and uh, the challenges that the grammatical structures of Australian Aboriginal languages pose. Uh, to our understanding of human language more generally, pushing that out. Uh, so, dear guests, please join me in welcoming Rachel Nordlinger for tonight's annual Codal Public Lecture. <laughs> Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Nick, for the introduction. And I'm sorry about those lectures, but they were at 10 a.m. I mean, what was I to do? Uh, thank you also to Uncle Greg Sims for a really moving and uh, entertaining welcome to country. And I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're meeting on today, and uh, some of whom are here, and I pay my respects to them, and also to their languages as the languages of this land as well. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the Indigenous people here today from wherever, wherever your mob is. Um, and as well as all the Indigenous people who are not here today who have over many years shared their languages with me and worked very hard to do that. Huh. I was worried I'd be nervous when I stood up here and looked at you all and I'm pleased to say I was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my topic today is partly prompted by a conversation I had Many, many years ago, before I set off on one of my early field trips, when I was talking to a friend and explained that I was about to go off and work on a language that just had a couple of speakers left and I was going to record and document this language. And my friend replied and, and asked me why I would want to go and learn a language that had only two speakers. He said, wouldn't it make more sense to go and learn a language that you'll be able to use, like Spanish or German or French or something that you could go and actually speak to more people in. And I think this view is a very common Australian mainstream view, which sees language as purely utilitarian. So you learn a language if, you have a, if there's a purpose for it. If you're going to go travelling or if you're going to marry into a family that speaks a language or you need some business interactions in that language. If you don't really have a purpose for the language, then you don't really bother. And this, in this sense, we, we don't see language as something interesting and worthwhile in and of itself in the way that we would think of a, a great piece of literature or a great piece of art as something that has inherent value just because of what it is. And we don't really think of language in that way. And this attitude's always puzzled me because from my perspective, languages are just fascinating, endlessly fascinating, and I don't understand why other people don't see them that way. And if I could learn every single language in the world, I could, I would, but I obviously can't. Um, <clears throat> but I also think this attitude is problematic in another way when it comes to Aboriginal languages of Australia. 
because it allows the broader Australian population to just think of Aboriginal languages as something that really just matter to Aboriginal people, and they're not something that the larger Australian community really need to engage with, particularly. And I think that at all times, but especially given that this is the International Year of Indigenous Languages, it's time for us to try to redress this view. And what I want to do today is talk to you about some of the things, and that this is just only a very small number of them that I can fit into this time, but I just want to tell you some of the things that I find fascinating and amazing about Aboriginal languages and why I think all of us should find them interesting and fascinating and why they're really important to all of us. Okay, so as I'm sure many here are aware, uh, Indigenous Australia is a place of quite extraordinary linguistic diversity. Uh, if, depending on how we decide to draw lines between languages and dialects, we could conservatively say that there are at least 300 very distinct languages across the Australian continent. So as different as Hindi and English and Russian, let's say. If we don't worry so much about drawing lines between languages and dialects, we actually would say there's more like 700 different ways of speaking across the continent. Around of this, if, if we take this figure of 300 distinct languages, then there's maybe only now about 15 that are still being acquired by children as their first language. And there's maybe another 80 or so that are still spoken by small numbers of community members, often elderly community members. And there are also some languages that are, that, that are currently in, in the process of revival and communities are working very hard to revive languages. But even so, you can see there's been quite a lot of loss already in 200 years or 200 plus years. People often ask me how these languages are related to each other or if they're related to each other. It's a bit of a thorny question. But I think it's safe to say that most linguists assume that all Australian languages uh, are related to each other. But part of the problem is the time depth that we're talking about is so great that our current methods of determining language relationship just can't really stretch far enough for us to really prove it yet. So to give you a point of comparison to understand what I mean by that, if, um, so, so linguists have reconstructed a language or identified a, a hypothesized language that they call Proto-Indo-European, and this is the, lang the single language that almost all of the European languages have derived from, and also lang some languages from India as well, like Sanskrit and Hindi. And this language, Proto-Indo-European, is hypothesized to have been spoken you know, maybe 7,000 years ago, let's say. So in 7,000 years, you can start with one language, and in 7,000 years, you go from that one language to languages as diverse as Hindi, English, Russian, Greek, French, you know, Swedish, we could keep going, right? So that's an awful lot of diversity that you get in 7,000 years. So now think about the fact that conservative estimates have Aboriginal Australians living in Australia for 60,000 years, and they're probably just conservative estimates. So if you can get that much diversity in 7,000 years, imagine the diversity you get in 60,000 years. And the, the problem is our methodologies just, just aren't able to really prove relationships once we're talking about time depths that great. The other nice part about this, for those of us who are interested in uh, Aboriginal languages, is that Aboriginal languages have had, let's say, 60,000 years of developing relatively uninfluenced by other languages of the world. And so they form a, a sort of natural laboratory of sorts for us to see interesting ways in which languages can develop. And as a result, we find not only a lot of diversity across Aboriginal languages, but also many interesting features that, some of which I'm going to um, tell you about today. 
But firstly, just a quick overview of what I've done, although Nick has actually covered some of this, so I can go fairly quickly. But people often don't know what linguists do. Um, I, don't, I think my mother probably still can't work out what it is I do. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the, the sort of work that I've done is what we call language description and documentation. I've worked with indigenous communities across the Northern Territory, particularly Wambaya, Guranji, Bilinara, Marangar and Murimpata communities, to support community efforts to um, maintain and revitalise their languages, but also to record and document the languages. And this is important because Aboriginal languages are traditionally not written. They, don't, they weren't traditionally written down. And that might seem strange for those of us from such a, a literate society as ours, but in fact, the large majority of languages in the world traditionally weren't written down. So Aboriginal languages are not really unusual in that respect when we look at it at a uh, global scale. Um, <clears throat> often doing this work, I've worked with the last fluent speakers of the language, and so this work, need, we need to record the languages because the languages aren't written down. If there are no speakers left, we risk losing all knowledge of the language if we haven't actually documented it and recorded it. And some of the work I do is on the academic side, so writing grammatical descriptions that Nick was talking about, but also work that is important to the community, so developing learner's guides, um, uh, stories, develop, helping to develop resources for the school and so forth. Now, why do these languages matter? Well, the first most persuasive reason why these languages matter is that they're extremely important to their communities. Languages, in some sense, are living museums and archives for cultural, important cultural knowledge and information. It's in the language that knowledge about history and stories and cultural heritage gets encoded. And for this reason, language for people has extremely strong connections to their ancestry, to their community, to their identity, and, and to their well-being. So there's, there is quite a bit of research showing very positive links between language and well-being for Indigenous people, not just in Australia, but around the world. Um, and I'll just highlight this so that you're not just taking my word for it in this uh, quote from a Yulngu speaker. Our language is like a pearl inside a shell. The shell is like the people that carry the language. If our language is taken away, then that would be like a pearl that is gone. We would be like an empty oyster shell. I think it sums up very nicely the way people feel about their language. So that's a very strong, important reason why these languages matter. But actually, that's not what I want to focus on today. What I want to give you is more reasons on top of those why these languages matter. And that's because these languages are crucially important to language science and our understanding of human cognition. Language is an extraordinary, uniquely human capacity. So while we know that other species have communication systems and we, and we hear stories about the complexity that we can find in the communication systems of other species, there is actually no other species that has a communication system as complex as human language. And there's no other species that has a communication system with the incredible diversity that we find in human language. So there are at least 7,000 languages in the world. It's probably a conservative estimate. And each one of these is distinct and represents a different window through which its speakers process and conceptualise and talk about and categorise the world around them. So I like to think of this, as you can see, like the play school windows. Right. So rather than having three of them, we have 7,000 of them. And rather than going and looking through the round window or the square window, we look through the French window or the English window or the Murimpata window. And each window just looks, the world just looks a little bit different. And each one of those exemplars of how the world can look is really important for us to build up our understanding of how the human brain works with respect to language. And obviously, in order to get a complete picture of this, we need to know about how all the languages of the world work. 
Australian Indigenous languages, and I'm going to show you some of these, have, have many interesting and unique properties that we don't find in other languages in, in the world, or we don't find in quite the same way. And so therefore, these languages are really important pieces in the puzzle that we're trying to complete of, of how human cognition works, how the brain processes and structures information with respect to language, and what the range of possibilities is in terms of how human language works. Okay, so let me give you some examples. One interesting way in which languages can differ is in terms of grammatical categories. And what I mean by that is the meanings that the language encodes in its grammar, so that as a speaker of that language, you're forced to engage with these meanings every time you speak the language, because it's in the grammar. You can't avoid it. So there's a, a well, I was going to say famous quote, I guess famous amongst linguists, um, from Roman Jakobson, who says that languages differ essentially in what they must convey and not in what they can convey or may convey. So what he means by this is all speakers of any language can say whatever they like, right? There's no, it's not, there's no limits to that. Everyone can say what they want to say in their language. But languages, one of the ways in which languages differ is in terms of what the grammatical categories are that they force their speakers to pay attention to when they speak. So, to give you an example of what I mean, in English, we have to pay attention to number when we are talking about things. So, if I say the child runs, that means one child, has to mean one child. And if I say the children run, that has to mean more than one child. And there's actually no simple way that I could say that sentence without telling you whether there's one, person, one child or more than one child. There's no way in which I could just say child run in a non-specific way and mean there's any number of children running and I don't know how many there are. So I can say it, I just did say it, right? But it's a much more convoluted way of doing it. I, the grammar forces me in a simple sentence to make a decision about whether I'm talking about one or more. So languages have lots of categories that they encode. If you speak other languages like French, you'll know that some languages have gender, for example, that you need to express. Um, and one of the things that's interesting for us as linguists is to think about what the set of meanings are across the languages of the world that get encoded grammatically. Right? There's a lot of stuff we can talk about. There's a lot of meaning out there. But only some of those meanings actually get encoded in the grammar. So what are those, those meanings that get encoded in the grammar? Which ones do, which ones don't? And even more interestingly, or perhaps harder to answer, is uh, can we look at some of these grammatical categories in languages and see whether they reflect cultural perspectives of speakers, perhaps? Is there any relationship there? So on that note, Australian Aboriginal languages are really quite unusual and perhaps unique amongst the world's languages in having grammatical categories that express kinship relations. So this means you have your grammar forces you to pay attention to how people are related to each other. And in order to utter a grammatical sentence, you need to make the right choice about that kinship relationship. Um, <clears throat> And of course, we know that kinship has overwhelming importance in, in, in Aboriginal culture. So maybe, maybe there is an interesting cultural connection here. To give you an example of how this works, I'm going to go to Murimpatta, which is the language I'm currently working on that Nick mentioned. So Murimpatta has a category, a grammatical category, in its verbs to encode whether the group of people you're talking about are related as siblings or not. Okay, so to give you an example, if in English, if I'm describing this picture, very cheesy picture that I got off the internet, um, we would just, you might say, well, they are talking. Okay, you, you have to use the pronoun they because there's more than one of them, but that's really all you need to say about who the group of people is that you're talking about. In Murimpatta, there's actually no single way to translate this English sentence. So in Murimpatta, I would say, if the two people are related as siblings, I would say, Pirim 
And if the two people are not siblings, I would say dimgintangaren. And I have to choose one or other of those. I can't just say nothing about siblinghood. I have to choose one or other. In the same way that in the English example I gave earlier about children running, we had to choose something. And in fact, these are not the only options because Murimpatha also cares about whether there's two people or whether there's more than two people. So in fact, there are four ways to translate that English sentence because if there were more than two people, I would need to say pirimgeren if they were siblings. And if they weren't siblings, I would have to say nimme. So this is cool, right? This is interesting. You, know, you have a grammatical category for sibling. And what's even more fascinating is that Murimpata is the only language in the world that we're aware of so far that has a grammatical category like this just for sibling. So this is just one little reason why we need to know everything we can about these fascinating languages. There are lots of other Australian languages that also encode kinship in their grammar, but they do it in different ways to this. So here's another example from, now from Ladel, a language uh, spoken or from the Gulf of Carpentaria region. And in Ladel, the, um, kinship is encoded in the pronouns, so in the translations of words like we, you, and they in English. And what Ladel does is sort of group the pronouns into two groups, which I'm calling even generations and odd generations. So your even generations are the people who are related to you at the same generation level, so your siblings and cousins, or the people who are two above or two below you, so your grandparents, uh, grandparents and grandchildren. Okay, so all of those people, siblings, cousins, spouses, grandparents, grandchildren, are all sort of one generation category the even generation category. And then the odd generation category are the other ones, so the parents, aunts, uncles, children, great-grandparents, great-grandchildren, and so on. And in Ladel, whenever you talk about a group of people, you've got to choose the right pronoun to indicate whether they are related as even generation or odd generation. So if I'm talking to my child or my nephew or my parent or my aunt or someone who, who I'm in an odd generation relationship with and I want to say, let's go west, I would use this pronoun, nyangi. But if I'm talking to my sister or my cousin or my grandmother or my grandchild, I would have to use a different pronoun, nyari, because we're an even generation relationship. And this means that Lado has 16 pronouns to translate we, you and they in English because you need to know for every one how people are related. And clearly this means that if you're going to speak Ladel, you need to have people's relationships, you know, in your head so that you know how to form a grammatical sentence. It's a very different way of looking at the world, right? It's a very different window that we're going through. Right. Um, another interesting uh, phenomenon that we can find in Australian languages is uh, case marking. So this is getting a little grammatical, but it's all right. Strap in. I'll lead you through. Um, <clears throat> so case markers are markers that go on the ends of nouns to indicate the role that that noun is playing in the sentence, what the job is of that noun in the sentence. If you learn Latin at school or you speak uh, German or Hungarian or Turkish, you'll be familiar with case marking. English doesn't really have a lot of case marking. We tend to use word order to do this job. So if I say the child is chasing the dog, you know the child's doing it because I put the words in that order. If I say the dog's chasing the child, that now means the dog's doing it, right? We, we put the words in the order to convey what job each noun has in the sentence. With case marking, you put markers on the nouns to do that. So if English, if we had a pretend English that had case marking, it might be like this. We might put a little marker on child to, to indicate that it's the doer of the action. It's the thing doing the chasing. And we might put a little marker on the dog to show that it's the thing that had the action done to it. It got chased. Now, many Australian languages have very elaborate systems of case marking. And one of the things that's interesting about having elaborate systems of case marking is that actually often then you don't really need word order to do the work it does in English because the case marking's doing it for you. 
So let's have a look at Wombaya, another language that I worked on from the Barclay Tablelands region in the Northern Territory. So Wombaya has case marking. You can see here in the sentence, that Alangi, the word for child, has ni on the end, and janji, the word for dog, has ji on the end, and that's telling you what child and dog are doing in the sentence. And in fact, in Wombaya, I could put these words in whatever order I like, and it will still be grammatical, and it will still mean exactly the same thing. So I could say, nyuru nyuru gen alingini janji, or I could say, janji gen alingini nyuru nyuru, or any other of the logically possible combinations. And it will always mean the child is chasing the dog because alingini will always have its little ni marker on it and janji will always have its little ji marker on it and will, so we'll always know who's doing what. If I wanted to say the dog chased the child, of course I can do that, but I don't need to change the word order to do that. I just do that by changing the markers. So I would say alaji gina nyura nyura janyini and now alaji has the done marker on it and janyini has the dua marker on it and now it means the dog's doing the chasing. And once again, I could put that in any order I like as well because you're always going to know what's going on. So this is really a very different way for a language to operate than what we're used to from English and other European languages. Now, if you did Latin at school and learned about case marking, you would have learned that each noun just has one case. Okay, they just, the noun has one job in the sentence, it has its case marker, and that's all you need. And in fact, this was what was believed for language for a very long time and is actually built into many of the universal theories of language structure that have developed around the world. Until we discovered the way case works in some Australian Aboriginal languages. So sometimes the role of a noun can be ambiguous, as in this famous joke from Groucho Marx. Okay? One morning, I shot an elephant in my pyjamas. How he got into my pyjamas, I'll never know. Now, where the, the ambiguity and the humour comes from here is that in my pyjamas is, is a location. It's specifying that there is something located in my pyjamas, but it's ambiguous as to what is located in my pyjamas. Right? It could be me, or it could be the elephant. And in the English sentence, it's ambiguous as to which one it is. Of course, in normal context like this, you would assume it's me. But the joke comes from the fact that there is an ambiguity there. Right? Now, in English, we just live with this ambiguity and make jokes about it um, and talk about it in first-year linguistics lectures and so on. But some Australian Aboriginal languages have actually de developed a really ingenious way to resolve this ambiguity by allowing nouns to stack up those case markers to tell you exactly what's going on in the sentence. So now we're going to move to a language, Walbury, and now we're talking about shooting kangaroos on the rock because I couldn't find words for elephant and pyjamas in Walbury. Um, <clears throat> so if in Walbury, if we're going to, if so we, a sentence like Jabananga shot at the kangaroo, Jabananga has a case marker on it to show that, that he's, it's the noun doing the action. Kangaroo has the case marker on it to show that the, direct, the action is directed at it, at the kangaroo. That's fine. All well and good. Now, what happens when, if we want to say Jabananga shot at the kangaroo on the rock? Okay, it could be that the kangaroo's on the rock. It could be that Jabananga's on the rock. Okay, in English, there's an ambiguity there. Is there an ambiguity in Walbury? No. So have a look at what Walbury does. What Walbury does is rock carries its own little marker to tell you it's the location, but then it actually carries an extra case marker to tell you which of the nouns is actually on the rock. So if the kangaroo is on the rock, then rock gets the little at case marker because that's the case marker that kangaroo has. If it's, the, if it's Javananga on the rock, then rock gets the little dua case marker to show you that it's Javananga. All right, is that not cool? That is cool. <laughs> so that is a genius 
solution to this problem, right? You just take the resources that the language already has and you use them in a really efficient way and you fully specify the meaning and you don't have any of the ambiguity that English has in that sentence. Now, not only is this just cool, it also reveals something very fundamental about how languages can work. And it's something that we didn't realise was possible until the right linguists started working on these languages and revealing the way they worked. We would never have known that human brains could do language in this way if we hadn't learned about these Australian languages and how they work. All right, another interesting grammatical phenomenon that we find in uh, many Australian languages, particularly Northern Australian languages, is a type of grammatical complexity that linguists call polysynthesis. Um, but really what it is is where languages have extremely complex verbs that can build up multiple meanings, uh, sorry, not multiple meanings, can build up complex meanings that in another language like English would require a whole sentence to express. Now, languages in the northern parts of Australia that have this sort of system are languages like Gunwingu, Anandiliagwa, Tiwi, uh, and many others, and I'm going to give you some examples from Murimpata. Okay, so let's say you're trying to describe a situation where there's a group of you, and you've left your bags over there, and then you all turn around and notice that someone's going through your bags, stealing things from you. In English, if you wanted to describe that situation, you'd need to use a sentence with lots of words in it, like I just did. You know, oh, he's over there going through our bags and stealing things from us. In Murimpata, you can do that with one word. And I'm going to play it for you so that you can actually hear the, the Murimpata speaker say it. All right, I'll play it again. It's just a single complex verb that carries all of that meaning through lots and lots of bits and pieces, prefixes and suffixes, all built up to convey a single complex meaning in one verb. And because it's so cool, I'm going to give you a few more examples. So this is the word that means, that describes someone who uh, is like looking at, at you like this from under his arm, sneakily watching you but pretending he's not. And um, he's sneakily watching us, of course, who are not related as siblings, because remember, Murimpata is the language that also encodes the siblings. And then one more, because this word just sounds so beautiful. Uh, this describes a woman who is um, doing another woman's hair and making it, making it look beautiful. Okay, so clearly a language with big, long, complex words like this must work grammatically in a very, very different way to a language like English. And this raises really interesting questions about how languages are processed and how languages are learned. Like, do Murimpata speakers process their language in the same way that English speakers do? if given that it works so differently? And do Murimpata learning children go through the same sort of developmental sequences when they're learning Murimpata that English-speaking children would go through when they're learning to speak English? And what could all of this tell us about the way the human brain works and, and the human capacity for language? So we've been running a project over the last few years looking at language acquisition in Waria. So Murimpata is one of the languages where children are still learning the language. So we can actually look at how children learn the language. And this is important because all of our knowledge and understanding about how children learn languages is based on children learning languages like English and French and German, which work very, very differently from Murimpata. And obviously, if we just base our research on a small number of the world's languages, we're not getting the full picture, right? We need to understand everything we can um, about how to learn all different types of languages before we really know whether children learn all languages in the same way or whether they have to learn different languages in different ways. So, for example, children learning English often have trouble with long, complex words especially long syllable words, and often don't learn them until later. Maybe they're four or five years old by the time they 
learn those very long English words. So what does that mean for a language like Murimpata that's full of these big long words? Does it mean that Murimpata speaking kids just learn their language a bit later because the big long words are hard? Or does it mean that they actually learn the big long words earlier even though English kids don't? That's part of the questions that we would, we're interested in exploring in this project. So what we've done is, um, well, there's, a, there's a team of people doing this. Um, we've recorded uh, Murimpata acquiring children um, over a number of years, running around, playing with their peers, and wearing these little backpacks that have a microphone attached on the strap and the, the transmitter receiver in their backpack. And that means they can run around and play and we can still hear what they're saying. When we first started this project, we were worried that the kids would not want to wear the backpacks. And then, before too long, we started considering whether we would need to have placebo backpacks because the backpacks were so popular that even the kids we weren't trying to record wanted backpacks. So we actually, we're going to have some pretend ones just so um, kids could all have a turn. So we go out bush with the caregivers and the kids run around and play and we listen to their language. Well, what have we found? Well, the first thing, of course, we found is that big verbs are hard. There is no doubt about it. So you're, what you're going to hear here in this little excerpt is the adult is going to say a big long word, which means you're not giving us a chance, and then say tama. And tama means you say it. And this is a very common murimpata way of teaching language. And I can tell you they do it to me all the time and I sound exactly like this two-year-old you're about to hear. Okay, so what you'll hear is the adult saying the word and thumma, and then you'll hear the child's response. <laughs> I'll play it again because it's so good. <laughs> so that's basically my level of murimpata, right? I, I speak murimpata like a two-year-old. Okay, so big verbs are definitely hard. However, Jokes aside, we do find quite extraordinary complexity in the language of really quite young children. So here's an example of a three-year-old, and I'll play this excerpt. When I tested this in the theatre earlier, it's got some um, background noise or something that is a bit annoying, so I'm sorry you can't fully hear it, but you'll get the gist. <laughs> Um, so that's quite a long, complex word for a three-year-old. Uh, here we have um, a three-and-a-half-year-old. And you can see that not only is there lots of syllables in these words, but there's little bits in there. I'm not going to tell you what they all mean, but the, the kids have to sort of get the little bits in the right place to get the word to be grammatical. So children have acquired actually a lot of complexity by three years old and are producing longer words than English children are at three years old, right? We don't expect a three-year-old learning English to produce words that are seven syllables long. But we just saw that Murimpata kids can do this at three. Now, what does this mean? Well, it, what it suggests is that children, and this is early stage results, but it suggests that children can adapt their learning to suit the language that they're trying to learn, right? It sort of makes sense, but it's not something we've really proven yet. That languages are not all learned the same way, but instead children work out what the important bits are of the language and they learn those because that's what matters for communicating. If you're learning a language like Murimpata, you've got to get those big verbs down earlier because that's the, an important way to communicate. If you're learning a language like English, you can say a whole lot without having to say a seven syllable word in English. You know, you can leave those ones till later. So this is really interesting and giving us really important information about how humans, how the human capacity for language works and shows the importance of doing this research across a whole range of different languages. All right, I'm going to end with um, just 
focusing a little bit on words, we've seen that Murimpatha verbs have great internal complexity, but sometimes languages just have really interesting concepts encoded in very simple words. And this is part of what's fun about learning other languages and learning about other languages, is that you find that languages carve up the world in different ways and have words that have meanings that you hadn't thought of needing that meaning for before. Some and this reminds us that language is just merely one of thousands of possible windows through which we or the speakers look out at the world. So in, a, in uh, Australian Aboriginal languages, we have, of course, a number of words that reflect important cultural practices. So in Wambaya, there's the word damangaina, which refers to a woman who has cut off her hair in mourning for her child. Now, that's not something we need a word for in English, but it's really important to have a word for that in Wambaya because that was a very important cultural practice. And so tied up in that word is a... Um, is, is a it's that whole cultural practice for the Wambai people. Uh, this is a, a word from Cook Dayor, which is a language from Cape York in Queensland. I should say a number of my colleagues have provided me with these words, so thank you to them. Uh, so this word means to go from one place to another via an indirect route so that you don't go past a kin member that you're in a taboo relationship with. Now, this might be a concept we would like to have a word for in English, <laughs> but we don't. <laughs> we also find um, that in, in words in different Aboriginal languages, we find knowledge about the environment tied up in the word itself. So here's an example from Maratil. The word miwengi refers to the fruit of the red apple tree. And what's interesting is that mi, mi is a little marker that means sort of edible, edible fruit or edible plant. And wengi literally means cloud. So mi wengi literally means edible cloud. Now you might think, why would you call the red apple tree an edible cloud? Or is this just coincidence or maybe just homophony or something? But no, it turns out that the red apple tree fruits at the time of year known as build-up, the build-up time before the wet season, which is when all the clouds gather in the sky, right, before the rains come. So, in fact, tied up in this word is knowledge, environmental knowledge, about how the fruiting of the red apple tree relates to the seasons in that part of the world where the Maratil people live. We also... Um, oh, here's another example from Binningunwok. Uh, which is particularly striking, um, where, so if you think of the English word hop, the verb hop, we just have hop, it's a particular activity, you just hop, people hop, kangaroos hop, you know, frogs hop. Um, but in fact, in Binningunwok, there are different types of hopping depending on the thing that's doing the hopping, and each type has its own verb, right? So, and these verbs aren't even really clearly related to each other. Okay, so where, whereas we think of hopping as one action, for the speakers of Binningunwok, there's actually many, many different ways to hop. The way in which an a agile wallaby hops is different from the way in which a male wallaroo hops. And that's an important difference that gets encoded in verbs. We also find a number of words that just might be useful. So, uh, bunjurbi <laughs> in Wambaya. I actually think this would be useful to describe, you know, when you're at the theatre and you're trying to squeeze past people. <laughs> we don't have a word for that. And this next one by a word, you will, if you have teenagers, you will relate to the usefulness of this word. <laughs> to be off in one's own world, sitting down and not participating in the conversation around them. And this word is even before iPhones and social media. Um, <clears throat> And this one I'm sure people can relate to from Manjiljara, Manarpa, meaning the tiredness of a pregnant woman. Very different sort of tiredness from other sorts of tiredness. So we could see that it's just, it can be fun and interesting to have a look at the way in which different languages express concepts in words. So I'll end with this last one, which is um, contributed from a colleague, Murray Gard, again from Binningunwok, which really is just extraordinary. So Burmalala 
is the name for a male antilopine kangaroo that is resting, lying on its side in part shade during the heat of the day, and the movement of the dappled light on its fur gives it the appearance of having covered itself with white clay, just as hunters do when they hunt these large animals. I mean, what an extraordinary amount of environmental and cultural knowledge tied up just in the meaning of one word. And this is the sort of stuff that we lose when languages stop being spoken and we don't know anything about them. Okay, so my take home message is that language diversity showcases the intellectual creativity of humans and each language is a different design solution to the, to the enormous challenge of how we as speakers convey our thoughts to someone else so that they can understand us. And what we see in the genius of Aboriginal languages is really unique and fascinating design solutions that greatly enhance our knowledge and appreciation of what humans can do with their language and through their language. And I think at all times, but especially with this being the International Year of Indigenous Languages, it's really important that all of us, Indigenous people and the broader Australian community, really understand how fascinating these languages are, how they're an important part of Australia's linguistic landscape and should be valued by all of us. Thank you. people who think of linguistics or grammar as an arid field, but I, I think uh, I can speak for everyone here tonight in saying that listening to this talk was like watching the, the whole country come to life when, it, when the monsoon arrives and everything opens up and springs into life. Thanks, thanks for helping us see it. So we have time for some questions. Uh, I don't know everyone here. Uh, some people are a little bit in the dark. Uh, but, so please, uh, if you want to ask a question, put your hand up. I might just have to say you, you up the back in the red shirt or something. Uh, you're first off the rack. And uh, yes, that come next. Uh, and uh, there's a roving mic. Uh, so please ask your question. And Rachel, it's a fun job of answering. Hi, um, I'm uh, really impressed by everything that I that I heard today. Um, I'm curious about Murinbata. Yes. Um, I've always, from a very young age, uh, felt that there was some kind of a connection between uh, the Dravidian languages of South India and uh, the languages of, of Aboriginal Australia. And I noticed that Murinbata is a language spoken in the Northern Territory, which is geographically close enough. And I noticed you also mentioned that the word for we is Nyangi. Now, in a lot of South Indian languages, in, in Malayalam, the language that I speak, it's Nyango, right? And I also noticed, for example, that, you know, language closer to us, Daruk, um, the word for Parramatta is Buramata, and the word Mata is very similar to a word that we have for a place, you know? So my mother's maiden name is Vata Mata. Right. Do you know if there's any connection between the two? Well, it's a very interesting observation and other people, I mean, it's, I actually often get asked this question by, by people who know Dravidian languages, so you're not the first person to notice similarities. Um, I think part of the issue is, as I said at the beginning, the time depth that we're talking about is just so great that we're not really, our methods of establishing any um, connection in a convincing way are just not up, we just don't have um, reliable methods to determine that yet. So we don't really know. I should also point out that sometimes there are just similarities between languages that really are just purely coincidence. So it's, it's, it, unless we could really prove it, it's hard, it's hard to know. But I agree there are some intriguing similarities. Thank you. There was someone here who was early. All right, I'm going to be boss. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to you next. There's some, someone up here, I think. I can't see you though. Yeah, here, all the way in the back. Okay. Um, do Aboriginal languages 
um, have, uh, do they use tones to communicate language? Uh, no. There's not meaning, sorry. Yeah, no. So you're thinking of tones like in um, some Southeast Asian languages like uh, in Vietnamese and Chinese and so on. We don't have um, tones like that in Aboriginal languages. Or, or even asking a question, for example, uh, in terms of... Well, there's certainly yeah. prosody and, you know, intonation patterns. Um, there's certainly types of intonation that are associated with asking a question and things. Yes, it's definitely that level of intonation, but not, not tones that actually distinguish words based on a, a prosodic tune. Thank you. Over here. No, oh, sorry, the woman at the back has been waiting. Oh, that's <laughs> Uncle Greg. Well, he can go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, person at the back is talking about the mathematical people, Parramatta. Well, Madigal means where many eels lie. That's, and that's why the Parramatta side is called Parramatta Eels, because where many eels lie. And, and when you see Gaal in the Dutch uh, tribal area, it's 35, most of us got G-A-L at the end. G-A-L means man. And when you see G-A-L, means Gaal means purity. Plenty, can you see that? And when we talk about languages, and people, um, people want to bring languages to uh, into the Dalek nation, but even so, it includes um, the Wiradjuri people over the other side of the Great Dividing Range, the, the Barkindji people from up around um, Wilcannia, and the, 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 the uh, what's the name, the Dalek people, the people on the south coast, all the coastal uh, tribal areas from the Bunjalung people up north, we need to uh, stick to our um, tribal words because uh, we, can't, we can't afford to have languages brought onto the coast or maybe anywhere in New South Wales from anywhere else because, well, there's a lot of protocols in, in everything and uh, the thing is that um, we could use a word from, uh, from some other, country in, in Australia might mean, mean to say, uh, you have a lovely day. But when we look at it on, in our country, it means I want to go to bed and have sex with you. <laughs> so you've got, to be, you've got to be very, very careful of you the language we look at. That's true. And, and a lot of the languages that Aboriginal people do use, they use a lot of sign languages. That's how we sort of got around with sign languages. Thank you, yes. Thank you very much. I come from Coffs Harbour and have recently started learning Gumbangia language up there. Yep. And it's just been a really amazing way for me as a white person to connect with country. So I wanted to ask about the language that had the kinship relatedness in it and whether that language actually had words that reflected kinship, relationship with the more than human world. So whether your totem connected you with Goanna, whether there was words that also reflected whether that Goanna is kin or not related. Um, well, there's certainly lots and lots of words related to kinship beyond just what I showed in the example. So I was just focused on the, the kinship meanings that are encoded in the grammar. But of course, there are lots of words for all your different kin. There are words for totem. There are words for country. There are words for your father's country, your mother's country. Um, you know, lots, lots and lots of different words related to kinship. And I was just showing the grammatical elements. But yeah, there's, it's a very big part of the, the language in, in many Aboriginal languages. So, yes. Uh, this one. You go, if you've seen someone, I can't, it's hard for me here in the dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. Um, just again on, on the, on the kin, kinship um, relations and language, I was just curious to know, I, I went to a talk before about um, the Darren language of the Sydney region, and um, 
the, there was this conversation about that you referred to Kim in a certain way, but also depending on the relationship that you had with that person, mm -hmm. that it was all, I don't know if it's like a pseudo language, but it was almost sounded like if it was different languages, if, if children were talking amongst each other. Yes. But then if you were talking to your mother, it was mm -hmm. like a different. So I, I can't speak for the Darug language because I don't know much about it, but certainly in uh, many Aboriginal languages, there are different registers that are different ways of speaking that you would use with different kin. So particularly kin that you're in a, a bit of a um, respect relationship with and that can, that those kin, who those kin are can, can vary across different communities, but it might involve, if you're a man, it might be your mother-in-law and it might be um, maybe even your father-in-law, it could be uh, brothers-in-law and so on, and for women it would be sons-in-law and so on. Um, and often there are respectful ways of speaking that you have to use with those kin. And again, it will depend on the community how different those respectful ways of speaking are from the regular language, but sometimes they're really quite different and have to be learned as different varieties, as different registers. Does all this work you do change your English? <laughs> Oh, interesting question. I don't know. I guess I'll, there's family here. They can tell you whether I sound different than I did 30 years ago. Um, I don't think it has changed my English. I think that's a very interesting question. I don't think it's changed my English. I think it has changed my... It's, it's broadened my perspective on the world and it's given me a much deeper understanding of how English is really just one way of talking about things. And it's not the right way or the best way or the only way, it's just one. And there are many, many, many others that are, that are equally and often more interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask, you quoted where you are. over to your right at the front. Oh, right. Hi. <clears throat> the number of um, languages you said that children are acquiring as their first language. Yeah. I can't remember the number now. I think you said about I said around 15. 20 or yeah, yeah, okay, 15. I was wondering if any of those are in Southern Australia or if they're all in Northern Australia. They're all, the ones I was thinking of are all in Central or Northern Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Last question, apparently. I've been, I've been told by boss. Um, a, a few years ago, you wrote a book with um, Harold, Harold Coke. Oh. Um, yes. And, um, oh, well, I edited it. I didn't write the book. It I, edited, I wrote sorry. some bits of it, and other people wrote other bits. Yeah. Um, in 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 that um, uh, there there is a detail um, that the uh, enthuse a person to uh, learn a, a, a language of, of this continent, and um, my my question relates to. Um, what, what advice you would provide to a person who is uh, uh, interested in, in following up with uh, engaging with uh, people um, and language which emanates from this continent? Well, um, obviously it depends a lot on where you are in the country, but there are some uh, universities that are beginning to offer some courses in Aboriginal languages. Um, Charles Darwin University offers a course in Yilmore and uh, just a, new, a newly developing course in Binningunwok. Um, and I'm pretty sure that those can be accessed um, online, remotely. And, and there's a number of other languages. Um, Gabilaroi is also taught through, I've got colleagues in the room who could tell me whether it's AMU or Sydney University. But anyway, there are a few universities around that are offering courses in uh, Indigenous languages, so that would be one place to start. I think I'm being told we need to stop. Hello. Can I ask a question over here, please? Oh, over there? Yeah. Okay, last yes. question. Last one. Yeah. Barbara Sims, Vegetal Woman, Traditional Owner and Custodian of Slandia. Hello. Hello, Dalma, how are you? I'd like to ask you a question. Look, language is really fascinating. It's fascinating. Our second, our first language is Aboriginal language. Yes. Our second language is English. Yes. Greg, beside me, we as children, our first songs we were singing first was in French. We had to learn the French and sing very fluently the Marseillaise. 
Wow. We were marched from Lava School down to the monument and crammed in like sardines. Wow. The only thing they left at home was a can opener. <laughs> so, look, I look at it really fascinatingly, and our language on the coast is Durga. Yeah. Right. And then my mother's language, South Coast, Wandi Wandi woman, is much different than my father's language from my Peru's. So it's really yeah. unique when we look at language. Because Absolutely. That's I was why thinking, I was thinking myself, I'd be, you're a deadly mum. <laughs> so, people, that's, she's, a, she's a great woman, that's what I'm saying, mum. Right. And, and we have Dubai, we have the, all those languages, but it's fascinating when we go into a place and we can be talking and someone have no idea, and then you go to another place, you've got French speaking people, Japanese speaking people, yeah. and you've got no idea what they're saying. Yeah. But no, we no. as a people have a unique race, a unique language, a unique culture. It's the oldest living culture in the world, still connected to the country. Yeah. The lady I'm sitting next to here had never left country from the time she was born. And a prominent sporting woman as well, so. We forget about all this with our women. Our women are the backbone in our communities. No Absolutely. Matter, in any given Aboriginal community, we are the backbone. I am grateful to have you here on my country. I'm pleased. Thank you. And welcome to our land and continue what you're doing. So you grace our shores with what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Rachel, better than you did, and it wouldn't have been appropriate for me to, to thank her in the way you did, so, so thanks for those uh, lovely words. Um, just before we finish up, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. So one is, as mentioned, it's the International Year of the Indigenous Languages. Shouldn't just be a year, should be a century or a millennium or from now to the end of time. And let's do all we can, uh, and I hope that everyone in this room will think about whether it's learning some indigenous language or more than one, or teaching if you know one and, and want to pass it on, uh, but also as a citizen, uh, doing some of the things that we need to do to get justice and fair recognition of indigenous languages in this country and in the countries that surround us. There are still uh, whole parts of Australia where if you are growing up speaking your mother tongue and producing some of the words that three-year-old Mulimpata uh, kids are producing, you're being diagnosed as you know, behind on English or something and, and the education you get does not respect the knowledge that you have in your mother tongue. So there's battles to fight there and please all let's remember that and use this year as a very special opportunity to advance that cause. Uh, a second thing I'd just like to bring to everyone's attention is that CODAL uh, has brought in uh, a special prize that's given every two years called the, the Patchy Doors Award in a way that recognises what Uncle Greg told us about playing tunes with both the black keys and the white keys because it recognises, we think it was the first time that an Aboriginal person, Patty Goran, taught a European, uh, Lieutenant William Dawes, an Aboriginal language. Happened in this area uh, back there from 1788. Uh, we want this um, award to recognise the contributions of teachers uh, because language teaching is not given enough recognition in this country. It's set up so that people can nominate someone who has had a profound effect on their lives through their, through their teaching. And we would love to get more nominations and we would especially like to get nominations from inside Aboriginal and other Indigenous communities uh, of people who have done that for you. There are some brochures outside, uh, so take a look and if you want to follow that through, uh, please uh, do so or, or contact us at CODAL or contact me or Rachel because we're very keen uh, to get a flood of good applications this year. So uh, now just concluding the evening, I'd like to remind you there are still uh, more refreshments outside. Please join us uh, there and mingle uh, and celebrate not just the, uh, the wond wondrous languages we've heard about, uh, but the chance to, to talk more about them there. And please join me now in thanking Rachel Nordina for all